Welcome to Global Information Security Society for the Professional of Pakistan. Hi, Jay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rehan Bashir. Today, we will start the Cloud Certified Security Professional uh, Overview. So, this is a Cloud Security Certification, uh, which is uh, you know, by ISC Square. And ISC Square is an organization that also has CISSP certification. And I'm sure many of us has over here CISSP certification. So uh, before we actually dive into uh, the certification content, I think I would like to, you know, give you a brief overview of what is uh, CCSP and what are the prereqs for CCSP that a candidate needs to qualify before appearing in the exam. So uh, before we start, so what is uh, CCSP, which is CCSP stands for Cloud Security Certified Professional. And uh, this as per ISC Square, uh, to qualify CCSP, uh, candidates must pass exam um, and have at least five years of cumulative paid work. So what it means is that you have to be in cybersecurity field for at least five years, and you must be paid for that work uh, in those past five years. Means that you have to have a regular nine to five jobs in information security or IT in general, uh, of which uh, three years must be in information security and one year in one or more of six of the domains that are covered in CCSP. So there should be, you, you have to have five years of general IT experience. Out of that five years, you have to have three years of information security experience. And in those three years, you have to have one year of experience in one or more of the six domains that we will be covering in this uh, CCSP exam or CBK, which is called common body of knowledge. So, so that's the uh, uh, requirement, the first requirement to be appear in the exam, to qualify for the exam. So let's talk about the exam itself and what's the course itself and what we will be covering in CCSP. Uh, so the CCSP exam evaluates expertise across six security domains. We will be going over domain one today out of those uh, six domains. So, so you have to pass the exam uh, that will definitely test your knowledge, that will definitely test your technical experience, and that will also, your past experience plays a major, major role in passing the exam. So uh, I took the exam this year, and it's a mute Muhammad Tariq Nazar Sahib, aap please mute kar lijiye. So, uh, so, so we took, I took the exam earlier this year and I, we studied for maybe three or four months. Uh, Salman bhai, correct me if I'm wrong. And then, uh, you know, we all, uh, we studied in a group uh, setting and we all took the exam and we all passed it. And all of us have the common experience and, and the shared experience was that, you know, studying the book end to end is very important in this exam. What we are going to do today is give you an overview of domain one, which is cloud concept and architecture design. But what is expected of you if you want to pass the exam and if you are interested in the exam uh, in taking the exam and passing it is to study the book and study the book from page one to page last in order to understand, grasp the concepts that are in the book. And obviously, if you have experience in the field, whether in cloud security specifically or IT security in general, you should be able to pass the exam. And it's, it's not that easy to pass it, uh, but you know, it's not that difficult either. So the exam will have 125 questions and it will be a three hour exam 
and you will need 700 out of 1000 uh, as far as scoring is concerned uh, scoring is concerned so if you look at this uh, uh, diagram over here or you know image over here this is a breakdown of questions that you will be getting in the exam so as as we know that there will be six domains one two three four five and six and uh, these domains so these domains so we can see we are going going to go with a cloud concept architecture and design and you will get 17 percent of the questions from this domain 19 percent of the questions will be from cloud data security 17 percent of the questions will be from cloud platform and infrastructure security another 17 percent from cloud application security then 17 percent from cloud security operations and 13 percent from uh, legal risk and compliance so you can see the more the the large majority of the questions will be coming from cloud data security the second one the second largest is 17 percent and there are one two three four domains that you will get 17 percent of the questions and the 13 percent comes from legal risk and compliance so when i passed the exam i i wrote uh my experience and my thoughts on the ciss exam and the link is over here and if you are on my linkedin you can read this article on my linkedin where i actually went in detail on how i studied how uh, i prepared for the exam and what to expect in the exam and also i shared some of the resources that i use to study for the exam Everything is linked over here. So you can go to this uh, URL and you can read about it and click on these links, save these links, bookmark these links and use these links as, as, uh, as reference when you are studying for the exam. Any questions on this slide? Uh, please feel free to ask the questions in, uh, uh, in, in the chat. And for everyone, this session is being recorded, so it will be available after the fact. I want to add you one thing. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Well, when, when I exam, there is no back button. If you appear in my exam, this is nothing I want to add here. Yes. So yeah, there is. This is an adaptive exam. There is no back button, uh, unlike maybe CISSP exam. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. So once you start the exam then only way forward is to going forward. However, in my case, I did have the option of going back. You know, I know that they have probably changed that you are only going, you can only move forward and that cannot move back. But when I took the exam earliest this year, I had the option to uh, basically mark the exam, mark the questions that I did not know how to answer and can come back later. So, so I took the exam in US. Uh, that was the option available to me in US. I know some people took the exam in Canada and they did not have this option. Okay, Could you, moving forward. Any other questions before I move forward? Please feel, feel free to ask questions during, um, during the presentation. Do not wait until the last. I, I like to take the questions, you know, during uh, the session. Uh, so one thing I want to say that CCSP exam, although it covers basic security concepts that you have read in CISSP, uh, you know, it talks about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and, you know, uh, other basic concepts that you have studied in CISSP back, you know, data recovery, uh, business continuity plan and all those basic concepts. They are part of CCSP certification. But since those are general cybersecurity concepts, in CCSP, those contexts get applied in the context of cloud security. So you need to keep in mind. So definitely if you have CISSP exam and if you if you have retained those concepts in your mind, then passing CCSP uh, it will help in passing CCSP because you are not learning the concepts of cybersecurity over and again. So I would, I would 
I would not compare CISSP with CCSP. These are two separate exams. Uh, nothing is, uh, you know, easier or harder than other. They both are individual exams. They both have their own strengths and we, uh, and they both have their own content. So do not compare CISSP with CCSP. Okay, next step. So, so today, as, as I mentioned that we're gonna be starting with domain one and domain one is what we call cloud concepts, architecture and design. So we will be talking about general cloud concepts, what the cloud architecture is and how it is designed and how it is designed uh, for use of consumer and how you know, cloud service, service providers are you know, hosting it and managing it. So let's start with cloud computing concepts. So uh, this is the definition from NIST. Uh, and what means is that cloud computing is a model of enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to share pool of configurable computing resources. So what it means is that what cloud computing in general, in essence, is that it is ubiquitous. What it means is that it is always present, right? If you want to access AWS, it's always there. If you want to access Azure cloud services, it is always there. If you want to access Google cloud services, it is always there, right? So that's what ubiquitous mean, that it is always present. Uh, then convenient, you know, easier to understand that it is easy to access any cloud services. You just log into AWS interface or, you know, Microsoft Azure interface or Google Cloud interface, and you can access the services that you want to use, whether it be storage, whether it be processing, whether it be, uh, you know, any other cloud services that are databases that are available out there. And this is on demand network access. You know, if you have an internet connection at your home, whether it be a Wi-Fi, your cell phone or any other connection, you can access cloud service. And to a shared pool of configura configurable computing resources and computing resources are what we call networks, servers, storage, applications and services. So these are all configurable computing resources, right? So that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal man management effort or service provider interaction. So whoever in, in this class or in this session have worked with cloud, you, need, you, you have seen how easy it is to access a cloud service, right? If you want to set up a, a machine, a virtual machine in AWS, you just log into your AWS account, you go to the management interface of your AWS, you select a machine and you spin the machine up without knowing what is happening in the background compared to that with if it is an on-site you know data center right you have to install a physical server you have to provide for network connectivity you have to provide for power you have to provide keyboard mouse all the hardware you have to provide the space and then if you want to set up your virtual machines on that you have to install software uh, virtualization software, and then you install virtual machines, and then you configure those. So there are so many steps that you have to do if you are doing it in your uh, at your own pace in your own data center. Compare that to with cloud now, right? You just log in, you go to Amazon.com or AWS.com, whatever the case may be. You log in, and you know you just go to the web interface. You hit start the machine, and the machine is set up for you. You do not know what is happening in the background that is the headache of your cloud service provider or we call CSP, cloud service provider. So I will be using CSP uh, throughout this presentation and CSP means cloud service provider. Any questions? Okay, moving on. So, so generally the cloud service model is composed of three things. Uh, and we're gonna talk about three things generally that encompasses this whole uh, uh, domain. First one, we're going to talk about essential characteristics of the cloud. We're going to talk about there are service models in the cloud, and then there are four deployment models in the cloud. So that's what uh, we're going to be uh, studying later on and talking about later on in the subsequent slides. All right, moving on. 
So if you look at it, this is a very simplified architecture of a cloud service provider. If you look at it from the top to bottom, the top is outside world, which is us. We are considered as cloud service users, right? So we are the one who are accessing cloud, whether it be AWS, Azure, G, uh, Google, or any other you know, cloud that you are using. And then you access the application layer, which is basically your browser. You log into your browser, you go to your cloud service provider web page, you log in, and then you start accessing various services from your cloud service provider. And that is the application platform. Under the application uh, platform, what happens is that, you know, you have compute and contro compute controller, which is basically your processor. Then you have your storage volume controllers, which are basically your data storage. And all of them are communicating via a management network. And all that communication that is happening in the cloud is using via APIs. So if you're going to your admin interface, that's the layer that what we call an abstraction layer because it abstracts physical layer and you do not know what is happening at the physical layer. Everything is happening via APIs, all the communication with the rest of the infrastructure, cloud infrastructure is happening via APIs, application, application programming interfaces, right? And then uh, underneath that you have management and orchestration where again, as I talked about, you have to set up your physical machine and, uh, and then you set up your hypervisors and on top of the hypervisors, you have to have your virtual machine, right? So hypervisors are uh, basically just like, uh, if you have heard about uh, VMware, you know, um, uh, what's another op open VM, you know, there are multiple virtual machine hypervisors that are available uh, out there. So you can use them to run your own virtual machines, whether it be Linux or, or Windows, right? So you have your hardware, hardware are running hypervisors and on, on those hypervisors, virtual machines are running. So virtual technology is a core of cloud computing. And then right next to it is management and orchestration, another layer which manages storage. Obviously, if you are communicating with cloud, you are basically sending and receiving data from cloud. So there is a place to store that data, right? So in order to store that data, you have to have a storage pool. So that's another separate entity in cloud uh, uh, architecture where all the data is being stored. Any questions uh, over here? So somebody asked, can we do our RDP to our cloud? Yes, uh, you can do RDP. So you in the cloud, you just set up a virtual machine, a Windows machine, and you enable RDP session on that. AWS provides that capability. Uh, Azure provides that capability. And, uh, you know, RDS sessions into RDP sessions into the clouds are usually through a secure uh, tunnel, mostly through SSH tunnel. Uh, in AWS, they give you a SSH key. You first establish that secure connection and through that connection, you uh, access your Windows machine via RDP. So yes, you can definitely do that. Okay, so uh, cloud computing terms. So here we're gonna talk about various cloud computing terms. Again, these are terminologies, these are very important from the examination point of view, uh, you, you need to understand these terminologies. And if you do not understand these terminologies, then you will have difficult time in, in, a, you know, in the exam. So if somebody asked the question, what are APIs? So APIs are just uh, a method of, uh, it's a programmatic interface it's a programmatic interface that allows one system or user to interact with other users. So for example, let's talk about Facebook or Twitter. So if you want to access certain services from Facebook or Twitter, you will not have access to the application itself. But what these uh, uh, you know, services do, they provide you an interface, uh, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a set of code which you, you can configure, you can 
you know, uh, configure and you can use to extract data and to get data from various services. So API is all the data that has been communicating in the web, it's through APIs, right? It's, it's a communication mechanism. It's a, somebody said it's a junction between two applications. Thank you very much. That's a good, uh, good analogy. So APIs provide a bridge between two applications, a bridge between an application and a user. So it's a program, programmatic interface. And usually in order to access it, for example, I need to download data, my data from Facebook or somebody else data from Facebook, right? So. Facebook allows you, if you go to developers.facebook.com, they will have, they will provide you their APIs and you can, through those APIs, access the backend data that, that you want. And you can get that data and you can process that data. Okay. So, so let's talk about uh, a cloud computing terms. So cloud application. Yeah, that's a good example. Another example is a good example. So a cloud application. So a cloud application is an application that is accessed via internet rather than installed and accessed locally. So that's what we call a cloud application. Example, uh, how many, are, I'm sure everyone of you are using uh, Office 365. If you have an Outlook account, right, you access your email, so basically everything is now in the cloud. So outlook.com is in the cloud. So outlook.com is a cloud application because you're app accessing that application through your browser via internet. Uh, cloud data portability. So these are very, very important terms. And the questions in the exam that you will get are mostly scenario-based questions. Uh, so, so for example, what is cloud data portability? So it's the ability to easily move data from one cloud provider to another cloud provider. Now, this is just a term, but this term has an implication, right? This term in the exam may appear in a form of a scenario, right? And scenario could be, uh, you know, you are a cloud customer and now you want to move your data from one cloud provider from an other cloud provider, right? So what that thing might call, it is cloud portability because you will be moving your data. Maybe you are AWS customer. You have your application hosted in AWS. You have your database hosted in AWS. Now you decided for whatever reason you want to move from AWS to Azure or you want to move from AWS to uh, Google Cloud, right? So that's what it is called data portability. Now, if AWS, if AWS has, uh, has a data in a proprietary format, which you cannot migrate or you cannot port to uh, Azure, then you are stuck with AWS. So it means that AWS is playing a dirty game over here, that they have stored your data in a format that have made you locked in into AWS and they are not allowing you to move you as a customer from AWS to any other cloud provider. So when you are basically uh, looking for uh, a cloud service provider, look at these things that do they provide, do they, are they storing data in a proprietary format? And they should not be, right? If you are, if you are storing data in SQL Server in AWS and you're moving data to Azure and they have SQL Server, data is portable because the same RDBMS is being used on both sides. All right, third one is cloud deployment models. So the way in which cloud services are made available through specific configurations that controls the sharing of cloud resources with cloud users. So the cloud deployment models are public, private, community, and hybrid. So you need to be very careful that there is a clear distinction, distinction between what is cloud deployment model and what is cloud 
service model. So we will look into all of these things in detail in subsequent uh, uh, slides. Uh, then cloud resources. So cloud resources is compute, storage, networking capabilities that a cloud provider share with cloud users. So when you're accessing any of the three major cloud services, they are providing you compute services, they are providing you storage services, they are providing you network capabilities. All of these things that you are using from your CSP are considered as cloud resources, right? And these resources include the physical equipment in the cloud service provider data center, as well as virtual resources like operating systems and applications. So if you look at this previous diagram, all of these things that you're looking at over here, these are cloud resources. These are physical cloud resources and these are virtual cloud resources. And you are accessing all of these resources through this application platform interface or APIs. Any questions? Okay, I see that good discussion is going on in that chat, which is good. Okay, so cloud service uh, strategy. Uh, sorry, cloud service, uh, cloud service. So capabil capabilities made available to cloud user by a cloud provider through a published interface, uh, a management console or command line, for example. So now you need to interact with cloud service. Right. If you are a cloud customer, you need to access those services. And how you access those services, you can access those services through management console, or uh, you can access those services through uh, through command line. So, like AWS, AWS provided you both capabilities. It 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 allows you to access AWS services through a web interface, and it also allows you to access AWS via command line interface. And again, that command line interface that you're communicating with AWS is via API calls. So you have to provide API key for authentication. Uh, once, you're up, once your API connection is authenticated, only then you are able to access the services that you have bought, that you have, that, that you have access to, that you're authenticated to use. So there's a whole security layer on top of APIs that is part of cloud. Uh, so that you know there is no commingling of data, and one person using the same cloud service cannot access other person's data. So we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, so the question is: Any man in the middle tag possible for APIs? Yes, it is possible if APIs are not secure. So now these all these cloud service providers they they are using. Uh, this technology called APIMs, which is API Management Interface. And you can think of it, it as an API firewall, right? And the purpose of, of those API management interfaces is, is that, you know, the API is not misused. Uh, you know, hackers can use denial of service attacks via those APIs using large requests to the backend services through APIs. So in order to throttle uh, that access, in order to control access, uh, you know, these API management interface do sit at the, uh, at the at management gate and, you know, they provide authentication, they provide throttling and, and type, type of and act as a gateway. So they're also called API gateways. So yeah, so they are, uh, you have to write the APIs very uh, securely and somebody mentioned OWASP top 10. Yes, you, you can use OWASP top 10 to look at uh, what are the threats to API and uh, how can you prevent them and how can you improve the security of APIs. And most of the API security are pretty much, uh, our threats are pretty much same as web application security because the, the communication mechanism as web APIs also use HTTP protocol and HTTPS protocol for communication over the web. All right, cloud service uh, categories. So, so what are different cloud service uh, categories? So we talked about services, so a collection of cloud services that share a common set of feature or qualities. So cloud services, service categories are labeled as 
X A A S, or which can be X can be thing anything as a service. So in general, so we'll talk about uh, I A A S. Uh, pass and SAS, uh, so, but anything as a service is called XAAS or ZAS. Any questions on this com computing term before I move on? Okay, so I was just looking at the chat. Okay, no more questions, let's move on. All right, so just to, so since CCSP is what we call a vendor agnostic certification, just like CISSP, CCSP is a vendor agnostic certification, means you're not studying about AWS, you're not studying about Microsoft Azure, you're not studying about Google, because those are vendor specific cloud certification. This certification will provide you an overall framework of what cloud is and what cloud security is all about. But just for reference, uh, we talked about, you know, there are different cloud services and those cloud services are, uh, sorry, where are the services? Okay, resources, there are various cloud resources and those are compute, storage and networking capabilities. So remember these cloud resources. Now, if you take this term and apply it to this uh, table over here, uh, you can see that all of these cloud service providers have their own names. I mean, these are just names uh, in their, uh, you know, service offerings and there's nothing more than that. So like, if you look at virtual servers or virtualization technology in AWS, it is called instances. In Microsoft Azure, it is called VMs. In uh, GCP, it is called VM instances, right? So the thing every is basically it is virtual server, but all of these three major cloud service provider calling it a different name. So, so do not confused about that why it is a different name. It's just name. It's just how they're branding it, right? But in at the at the base of it, it is virtual servers. Same game uh, goes with platform as a service. AWS called this Elastic Beanstalk. Microsoft Azure called this cloud services. GCP called it App Engine, but in essentially it is called Platform as a Service. So if you go through the through the list, and you know over the course of time, this this list might have changed. They change, they keep on changing the names of these services, uh, you know, often. So just you need to keep up to date at what they are calling it today. Maybe they are AWS, maybe not calling it an instance anymore. They, I think they call it AMI or something. So, so just be aware of whatever service you're using, just understand what is the name of the products that they're offering so that you're aware of it. Uh, you know, uh, for uh, object storage, AWS, everybody heard of S3 buckets, right? The same thing in Microsoft o uh, Azure, object storage is called block blob, right? In Google uh, platform, it is called cloud storage. Uh, file storage is AWS EFS, uh, Microsoft Azure is Azure Files and a cloud platform, a Google Cloud Platform is ZFS or Avere. So, so just want to give you a quick reference as to uh, how these uh, big service providers use the names of various services for branding. Any questions on this? Okay, so we're gonna be continu uh, continuing with uh, cloud computing terms. Uh, so cloud service customer data. So now these uh, data models are, these terms again are very important because understanding of these terminology will help you understand the questions that you're gonna get in, uh, in the exam. As I mentioned, there will be a lot of uh, uh, you know, scenario-based questions in the exam. So if you understand these terminologies, then it will be much more easier for you to understand what the question is, is and how you can answer that uh, accordingly. And my advice to you is take your time, read the question once, read the question twice, read the question thrice to understand because they ask the questions in a very indirect way. These are not very easy questions to interpret. And in order for you to get comfortable with their language, 
that how question is going to be asked, go through practice exams. Uh, the book that I studied was a Cybex uh, book, and it has a lot of questions uh, in the, at the end of the book, which we went through the book. And obviously, one of the purpose of going through the practice exam is to, you know, solidify your understanding, but also to understand the language that you will be seeing in the exam on how the method, the way they're asking the question in the exam. So, so you have to be, you know, read over and over again to understand how the question is being asked in order for you to answer the question in the correct way. All right, so another terminology is cloud service customer data. Uh, so any data object under the control of cloud service customer uh, and that were input to the cloud service by the cloud customer or generated by the cloud service on behalf of the cloud customer. So what is cloud service, uh, service customer data? Anything you as a customer produce, process or store in the cloud is your data because you are the customer. If you are hosting an application in the cloud, if you are using a service like Box, if you Box, if you are using an online storage ser service like Google Drive or OneDrive, anything that you're storing in those cloud services, you own that data. That is your data. So OneDrive, Google Drive, uh, Box, all of these are cloud storage uh, services. So if you are storing your data, that is your data. This is cloud service customer data, right? Um, second one is cloud service derived data. So what is derived data? Urdu mein aisa data jo ke kisi data ki wajah se wujud mein aaya. So so for example, you are uploading a file into OneDrive. You are uploading a file in Google Drive. So that your action of uploading the drive data to, to these storage services in the cloud, it will generate a log file at the cloud service provider, right? Cloud service provider will see that at this time, at this date, you have uploaded this file, right? In, in the simplest form. So that the log file that is generated as a result of you interacting with cloud service provider that is what we called a derived data. So derived data may include access logs, utilization information, and other form of metadata. Clear, any questions? So somebody asked, technically speaking, doesn't uh, CSP have access to customer data? Technically speaking, yes. So CSP does have access to your data and uh, they, because in, in, in short, in very short term, what cloud is, is basically you are using somebody else's computer to upload your data. So yes, they will have access to your data. Now, how you can prevent from them to, uh, to from, from not accessing your data, there are multiple ways, you know, there are ways legally that bound them to not to access your data, right? Then you have your, uh, NDA is not the uh, right term. That is NDA is non-disclosure agreement, right? We are talking about data over here, data access. So you can encrypt your data before uploading into the cloud. So, so when I upload my data into OneDrive or Google Drive, what I do is I encrypt my data locally first and then upload my encrypted file into the cloud. So that gives me an extra layer of protection that my data is not sitting there in clear text format. So, you know, if anything happens, somebody, uh, a cloud insider wants to access my data, he will only see encrypted file and he will not be able to see my file, right? He, because my files are encrypted. So, so there are things that you can do before you store the data into the cloud. Or maybe that cloud service provider got hacked, their S3 bucket got hacked. So, so you have to provide your security. Uh, cloud service provider data. So this data is any data object related to the operation of the cloud service uh, and that are fully under the control of cloud service provider. So uh, provider data may include cloud service operational data, information generated by cloud service provider to provider services and similar data not, on, not owned 
or related to any specific uh, data. So it is important that cloud service providers clear terms as what uh, what data they own and what customer own. So, so you need to understand one thing, the cloud model is a shared responsibility model. So both cloud service provider and cloud customer, they both have the responsibility. And when you get into agreement that you are uh, using certain cloud services, then there are a lot of legal bindings that needs to be uh, adhered to before you, while you are signing up that contract, right? And that will include confidentiality, that will include availability, and uh, what was the third tenant? Confidentiality, integrity, and integrity is the third one. So all of these three tenants that you have studied in CISSP exam, they all have to be addressed before that contract is established. And in order to establish that, uh, the document that actually provide that clear uh, clarity is called SLA, which we call service level agreement. And we'll talk about SLA in the, in, in the subsequent slides that what is included in this SLA. And uh, encryption does provide uh, you know, confidentiality and encryption also provide integrity of your data. All right, so community cloud. Uh, so what is a community cloud? So a cloud deployment model where cloud services are provided to a group of cloud service customers with similar requirements. So it is common for at least one member of the community to control the cloud resources from the group. So what is a community cloud? So we, we know there's a public cloud, we know there's a private cloud, then we know there's a hybrid cloud. What is this called a community cloud? So what community cloud is, so for example, uh, like, let's take an example in Pakistan, right? Government of Pakistan, all the agencies in the government of Pakistan are saying that we have to have a very, our own cloud service uh, infrastructure, which, which should be hosted by either AWS or Azure. So, so that they come up with their own uh, specific requirements of security. And what these service providers do is that they will create a specific cloud, they will dedicate it specific cloud resources for this particular community. So any client, any organization, if they want to use those services, since they are part of that government uh, community, they can utilize those services, right? Uh, in, in US, what we call is, is called FedRAMP, which is, uh, which is all these cloud service providers they have a certain segment of their offerings that is dedicated to a community, in this case, a government agencies. Again, there are universities who have their own uh, community, they form their own community, universities in the, in the country, and they have their own cloud services. But what you need to have is, as in any community, you have to have a community leader, right? to manage and to do all the, you know, other stuff. So, uh, in, in, so you have to have a community leader in that cloud community service in that deployment model that all members have, in, have, a, have a trust into to manage that uh, cloud deployment model. Any questions? Uh, yes, governing bodies depends upon uh, if what is uh, the requirement of your, uh, if there's a compliance requirement, if you're in an industry, say for example, in US, if you are a health service provider, right? Healthcare service provider, then uh, HIPAA is, is, uh, is one, is a compliance framework. Uh, if you are a federal organization, then you have to have FISMA compliance or NIST compliance. If you are a credit card service provider, then you have to have PCI. So these are different compliance and depends upon which industry you are in. So based on your industry, you, have, you may have your specific compliance requirements. But generally, uh, many of the countries are using NIST compliance secure framework to uh, establish security baselines. We'll talk about data reminiscence in the cloud. All right, uh, moving on with cloud computing terms. 
so data portability, again, we talked about it, that the ability to easy, easily move data from one system to another without needing to re-enter the data. So that is what we call data portability. Again, uh, simplest example is if you are hosting your database in uh, SQL or MySQL database on Azure, you should be able to just export the data out from MySQL in AWS and then import the data out, uh, import the data in into the SQL server hosted on Azure or Google uh, Cloud Service Provider, right? So that's what data portability means. It does not mean that, you know, you have entered the data in AWS, now it is not portable. So in that case, if you are trying to move to uh, Azure, then somebody have to sit and re-enter all that data in Azure, Azure provided database, which is pain to do, which is not an optimal solution. You know, you have millions and millions of records in, in a database, right? Nobody's going to, you know, type in those data again into the database if you are moving to a new cloud service provider. So portability is very important when you are, uh, you know, acquiring a cloud service. Hybrid cloud, so a cloud deployment model that uses a combination of at least, at least two different cloud deployment models, right, with public, private, or community. So cloud can be public, cloud can be private, but if you combine those, you may have uh, a private cloud, which is in your hosted, maybe in your own data center, and then you might have a public cloud, and you're using AWS public cloud or Azure public cloud, and, you know, they are both communicating. So in that case, it, it's a hybrid cloud uh, uh, deployment model. Infrastructure as a service. So what is infrastructure as a service? So cloud service category that provides infrastructure capability to the cloud service customer. So which is the lowest level of service that you can get from the cloud. By lowest level means uh, in the stack, right? So you have to have, uh, you have to have your uh, infrastructure that is your, your network, your servers, all the physical stuff. And then, so if you look at these three major services, IAAS, then you have PAAS, and top of that you have SAAS. And if anybody of you familiar with uh, seven layers of OSI security model, the base is, uh, you know, physical layer. And then as you move up, the seventh layer at the top is the physical layer. So just keep that in mind for reference. Uh, it's just that infrastructure as a service is kind of at, you know, a physical layer and data link layer, right? And then you have a pass, which is above that, and then SAS, which is above that. So at, IAS is at the lowest level. Uh, measured service. So measured service delivery of cloud service in such a way that its usage can be monitored, accurately reported, and precisely built. One of the easiest example is because you're using a service, you have to pay for the service, right? And there is a mechanism, there should be a mechanism to measure how much have you used. And, you know, that could be, uh, uh, that could be measured based on the amount of bandwidth that you have used to access those cloud services. It could be measured based on, uh, you know, the storage in the amount uh, in, in megabytes or gigabytes or whatever the case may be. Uh, so there are different parameters that are established, data points that are established that how you're using the service is measured. It's just like, you know, in your home, you have a gas meter or a electricity meter and it is measuring how much you have used and you get the bill accordingly. Uh, multi-tenancy is, is basically, again, allocation of cloud resources such that multiple tenants and their data are inaccessible from other tenants who share their resources. So this is the core of cloud computing, it, which is multi-tenancy, right? Multiple users are tenants, right? So think of it as an apartment building, right? You have an apartment building, a high-rise building, uh, and with multiple floors, with multiple rooms in it, and in, in those rooms, people are living, the tenants are living. So that building is basically, think of it as a cloud, right? And in that cloud, there are small apartments, small offices, which are occupied by, uh, by tenants in there, right? And each tenant has its own privacy. If I'm living on apartment number 241, and another person is living in apartment number 242. So we are, we are tenants of that building and building has multiple tenants. So building is what we call a multi-tenant building, right? So I 
I have my own privacy in 241. The other next person door next to me, 242 has its own privacy and we are segregated via wall between us, right? And we have doors and we have windows. So that's the same concept in, uh, in cloud that it is multi-tenant, but you need to make sure that the data of one tenant must not you know, interact or commingle with the data of other tenants. You have to provide segregation in data. You have to provide confidentiality. You have to provide integrity, right? So and then there are mechanisms of doing that and that's where cloud security comes in. Any questions on these terms? Uh, On-demand cell service, um, um, a characteristic of cloud uh, that allows a cloud service customer to provision cloud resources and capabilities uh, with little or no interaction with cloud service provider. Again, as I talked about, you know, AWS, it has you know, web interface on demand. You can just go there, you can do set up your service. You do not need to call somebody at, at AWS, hey, I need to do this. You just go to the web portal and you do whatever you need to do on demand self-serve, no interaction is required from cloud service provider, generally speaking. All right, moving on. Uh, platform as a service. So from IS, which is the lowest one, next one is platform as a service, which is a cloud service category that uh, provides platform capabilities and the cloud service uh, to the cloud service uh, customers. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so this one is basically, it's kind of in the middle uh, of IAS and SaaS. So in this case, uh, what cloud service uh, provider does is it provides you with, uh, you know, machines, uh, operating systems, and, you know, or, you know, Windows machine or Linux machine, whatever the case may be. And you also have your network infrastructure already set up for you. So network infrastructure, underlying infrastructure is set up for you. And then you have virtual machines uh, set up for you. And that's it. And anything else you want to do, it's up to you how you want to utilize those machines. So most of the cases, developers uh, in software houses, I have seen pass being used because developers have to do testing. So mostly in uh, what I have seen, the use case of pass is that developers actually use pass services to run their code and test if it is working as it should be. So pass is a very good uh, deployment model uh, or service that you can use as a lab, in a lab environment when you're developing software. Uh, private cloud, uh, cloud deployment model, uh, their cloud services are provided to a single cloud service customer who control their own cloud resources. So AWS may offer up, uh, you know, a private cloud, which is specific to an organization and that cloud is not being shared or used by anybody else. And pl uh, private cloud can also be hosted uh, at your own organization. There are cloud softwares that are available that from, I think their the cloud software a platform that is available from Red Hat that you can install and use at your own organization. Uh, public cloud, we know a cloud deployment model where cloud resources are controlled by CSP and uh, cloud services are made available to any cloud um, service customer. Again, your Office 365 uh, or you know, all of these are public cloud services. Uh, resource pooling, again, in cloud computing is aggregation of cloud service wider resources to provide cloud services to one or more cloud service customer. Again, uh, so if you go back to the diagram, so this is all of this, it's working together, what is called resource pooling. So there's a pooling of resource. So this is a storage pool, this is a compute pool. You all pool together, you put an interface on top of this, you put an application on top of it, and then you're good to go. Uh, reversibility. Okay, so this is somebody asked the question about data reminiscence. So this is where reversibility comes in. So this is a capability of cloud service customer to retrieve their cloud service data and for cloud service provider to delete this data after a specified period upon request. So that's where, so if you are, this, if you are a, a cloud customer of may, maybe AWS and you're moving, moving to a, Azure, so you have to tell AWS that all the data that was previously hosted at AWS should be deleted. And that's what that quality or that property is called reversibility, that 
when you leave that uh, cloud service provider, there is no data left on that cloud service. And, we, and then in the other domains, we'll talk about how this is achieved and what are the methods that cloud service providers use and guarantee that if you are leaving them, how they handle data. So data handling is another full topic that we'll talk about uh, later on in the subsequent domains. Software as a service, so this is at, in, on top of PaaS. So cloud service category that provides software application capability to cloud service customers. So again, uh, Office 365 is a great example of a software as a service. You know, you might have heard of Salesforce. So Salesforce is a software as a service, right? There are many other organizations who are offering their software as a service. Now, Adobe, you know, their Photoshop, their Lightroom, if anybody is a photographer over here, those are now offered as a software as a service. Um, tenant, uh, one or more cloud service users sharing access to cloud source. We talked about in detail, we talked about the example of a building where multiple people, multiple tenants living in the same building. That's the same concept applied to cloud computing. You know, there's a cloud service, consider cloud service as a, as a as an apartment building. And then in that apartment building, there are multiple users using that services offered in that apartment building. So, and tenants are the people who are using it. 